just a moment ago at the nine o'clock session around the corner, Nathan Hiltz, our artist in residence, was talking to us about Duke Ellington. And uh, I was struck by this quote, music is meant to be enjoyed, not discussed. And I was a little worried because I'm going to talk about some music this morning. But I hope the Duke and you all will forgive me because we really have such a rich offering of music this morning. But before we get to some of that music, I'm going to just speak about one of the musicians of this genre, the sermon. Martin Luther King Jr. was, of course, one of the greatest of 20th century preachers. And in his final homily in April of 1968, near the end of the sermon, he spoke about the danger that he was in, the threats that had been made against him and the possibility that he wouldn't live to see the realization of his life's work. But he said he wasn't concerned, he wasn't worried. I've been to the mountaintop, he said in those now famous words, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. Though he didn't know if he would get there himself, we as a people will get to the promised land, he said. Well, the next day, those words sounded very much like prophecy. A gunman shot him. His life ended before he could see the promised land of racial equality, the hope of a world without hierarchies. And though since his day, there have been great gains toward that ideal, discrimination and inequality are still with us. And yet the force of the vision that MLK preached, the force of that idea of a promised land is still with us. It gives urgency to the journey that we are still on toward a more just society. Well, of course, in that last sermon and in so much of his preaching, Martin Luther King Jr. was drawing on a black church tradition of seeing Israel's story as its own story the struggle of the people of Israel to escape from Egypt, their wilderness wanderings, and finally their settling in the Promised Land. From the very first, African slaves had seen that struggle as their own struggle. And King was drawing from this framework when he spoke about glimpsing the Promised Land. Near the end of his life, Moses had been taken up on the mountaintop, He hadn't been allowed, you'll recall, to come into the Promised Land himself. But God did allow him to glimpse it from afar. And King, in a similar way, knew that his time was drawing to a close, that the struggle for civil rights was not ended, but his work with it would soon be ended. And so in that last sermon, he talked about the way that God had given him a glimpse like Moses, of the mountaintop. Well, in many of our songs this morning, you can hear that tradition of seeing Israel's story as the story of a struggle for freedom in the contemporary context. We opened with that Afro-American spiritual, guide my feet while I run this race. And to some of the first singers of that song, there may have been a literal sense to those words. Despite its own racial inequalities, the Canada of a century and a half ago was for many a promised land, a literal place of freedom. The song may have been sung on the road north. I only learned after moving to Canada myself that nearby St. Catherine was the home base of Harriet Tubman for many years. She was known as a Moses to her people. Having escaped slavery, she helped others escape north. And in her missions, she embodied the prayer that we sang as we opened the service. Her life and the life of those she brought to Canada hung on their feet being guided in the race. But of course, the genius of the spirituals, 
is that they have two meanings. The race run is not simply the literal race, but also the race of this life, a race whose destination is God. The ambiguity is part of their genius. Slaves could sing about both earthly freedom and heavenly freedom without being accused of trying to escape to slavery. It's particularly evident in a song like Steal Away, Steal Away, Steal Away, Steal Away to Jesus. But of course, there are two meanings there. And there's fascinating material about how, the, how some of the spirituals were used to encode secret messages to slaves who were trying to escape. And yet, none of these songs was simply a cipher. The literal sense, the sense about the Christian journey, was also important to slaves. And that profound sense of these songs, the way they distill the Christian message into some of the simplest words, is one of the reasons that we still sing them today. They still apply to us even in very different circumstances than their composition. They still guide us on our own journeys of faith. Well, I've been thinking about that sense of the Christian life as a journey as I've prepared for this week. Ash Wednesday is just around the corner, and Pancake Tuesday, Shrove Tuesday, Mardi Gras is just two days away. And then, of course, we have those weeks leading up to Holy Week, to the passion of Christ and to his resurrection. For clergy, it can feel like a race, maybe more of a marathon than a sprint. But Lent is meant to be a journey for all Christians, not those of us in collars. And there are some distinct echoes of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness and our own wandering all the way to Jerusalem. There are 40 years for the Israelites in the wilderness and 40 days for our pilgrimage. Esau McCulley, a New Testament scholar and a sometime New York Times columnist, has recently written a book about Lent. And in it, he picks up on this theme of Lent as a journey before the movement toward the promised land of the resurrection can begin, he says, there has to be a change in our direction. Here I'm quoting, Lent is about turning away from our sins and toward the living God. This renewal, this change in direction, is something we need not just once in our lives, not one conversion, but again and again. And so Lent is meant to change our direction, to set us out on this journey with Jesus. And yet, we're not quite to Lent yet. We can't get ahead of ourselves. Before we come to that starting line of Ash Wednesday, we are taken up on the mountain, just as Martin Luther King was. But perhaps you noticed there's not one but two mountains in our readings this morning. We have the mountain of Moses, and the mountain of Jesus. Our Old Testament lesson records the giving of the law to Moses. It's a story that's right at the heart of our Jewish siblings' faith. Mo mountain climbers sometimes get sunburned from the reflection of the light from snow. And Moses, when he comes down from the mountain, is glowing too. But he's glowing not from sunburn, but from being so close to God's glory, what he's seen has changed him. And there's an echo of that earlier encounter that Moses had with God in the burning bush. Later in the choir, later in the service, our choir will sing for us an anthem by a contemporary composer, Ego Sum. And that song in Acts, the moment where Moses is first called to lead God's people. You'll remember he stops to see a bush that's burning but isn't consumed. And it's there that he receives God's very name, a name Jews today still consider too holy to pronounce. And the anthem, the song, is about that moment 
Ego sum is simply Latin for I am, the traditional translation of God's name. And yet I am is a curious kind of name, for we serve a curious God, a God whom when we encounter, we are terrified and thrilled at once, as Moses was. And that's certainly what Jesus' friends experience when they go up on their own mountain. They are thrilled and terrified to find that the person they thought they knew, the person they'd been following along with, is someone else entirely. God's glory shines out from Jesus' face. The early church often talked about Jesus as a bit like a piece of iron that's been heated in a fire. God's life fills Jesus' life, just as warmth from a fire fills iron. Jesus is entirely immersed in the crucible of divine love. And yet, like the bush that Moses saw, Jesus is not consumed, even as he burns. I love that moment where Peter suggests that maybe he can make himself useful and uh, make something, maybe some uh, tents for the people gathered there. One of the other gospel writers adds that he clearly didn't know what to say, so he just said something. I think we can relate to that, even if we haven't quite experienced what Jesus' friends have. The, th- the sense in this encounter, in this mountain peak, is the same with Moses. To come into the hands of the living God is a fearful and wonderful thing. And so right before the start of our Lenten journey, we're taken up to the heights and we're given a vision of our destination. We see where we're headed. And what the transfiguration, this moment where Jesus is shown as he truly is, tells us is not simply that he is alive with God's life. It also shows us our own destination. We too are meant to be alive with God's life. It's a picture of what God intends to do with us, to burn within our lives without consuming them. The way King or Tubman burned with God's passion and God's love in the face of persecution and hatred. That is the destination that Lent takes us into the fire of God's love. To paraphrase one of the first African bishops, God became like us in order that we should be like God. Well, that may sound a little bit abstract, and we are, after all, called Grace Church on the Hill, not the mountain peak. We're maybe more comfortable with a middle level of spiritual experience not the ecstasy of Moses or Jesus, but somewhere in between. All the same, I would say that I think this sort of sense of transfiguration, of the world being changed, of God's glory shining out, is a little bit more common than people sometimes assume. As clergy, it's one of my privileges to hear about these experiences, probably more than others do. But you don't have to have a transfiguration experience to follow where Jesus has led the way. There's room for the more humdrum also in this community on the hill. Well, we come to this season of Lent, this journey toward Christ's passion and resurrection, and there are opportunities for us to travel this road together. They may not involve the fire of the mountaintop, but they are still ways in which our hearts can be set aflame for God's love. You can come on Tuesday. You can enjoy pancakes and see God meeting us in neighbors and strangers. And then on Wednesday, to have ashes rubbed on your foreheads and be reminded that we will be burned eventually. We will be ashes as we came from ashes. You can make a Lenten commitment. You can choose a small way to let God's fire burn in your life. 
and you can share it with other people in this community. But before we get ahead to Lent, we ought to look at this light, the light that burned on the mountaintop for Moses, the light that burned in the lives of people like Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King, the light that shines even now from that stained glass window and from the legacy of Desmond Tutu. So look, look at the light, see what God is doing.